here. I'm Marianne LaMonica, and I'm the Chief Curator and Associate Director of the Gallery of the Bard Graduate Center. And tonight's program is being presented in conjunction with our uh, exhibition, Barbara Nessam, An Art for Life. And Barbara Nessam is here and will be <laughs> one of our panelists tonight. Thank you, Barbara. And um, I hope everyone has been able to see the exhibition. Um, and if you haven't, the gallery is open tonight until 8. I don't know if we'll be out of here by then. But the show is on view through January 11th. So if you haven't been or if you have and want to go back for more, please, please do. Um, I just want to take this time to also tell you a few things about our upcoming public programs. Um, so in conjunction with Barbara Nessam and Art for Life, we have um, a talk by legendary <coughs> art director Ruth Ansel, who was one of the, the youngest art directors for Harper's Bazaar in the 1960s. She's speaking on November 6th. We have a presentation on, December, on November 18th by Douglas Dodds, who's the curator of the exhibition, but also curator of word and image at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And he'll be talking about collecting early computer art, which he's been doing at the v &A for a number of years. And on December 4th, we have a very special <laughs> conversation with Barbara Nessam and Gloria Steinem, who is a longtime friend of Barbara's. So I hope you will consider um, coming to those programs. Um, also, in conjunction with our Focus Gallery exhibition, which is Visualizing 19th Century New York, which also shares um, an interest in visual culture in New York, um, except focusing on the 19th century. This coming Saturday, we have a walking tour of Lower Broadway that will focus on some of the sites that feature in the exhibition. Um, next Thursday, same time, same place, we have a, a talk by a professor from CUNY on the, on the history of the illustrated press in Gilded Age America. And then also on the night of, I forget now, I need Melissa's help, let me check. We have a wonderful concert coming up on um, December 14th, which will focus on the sounds of New York in the 19th century. So please pick up one of these flyers and go to our website so you can learn more about our programs. Um, and also please silence any of your digital devices <laughs> before our program so we can enjoy all of our speakers. Um, so let me begin um, to introduce our guests tonight. I'm actually going to introduce Steve Heller, who is our moderator, and then Steve will inter introduce our panelists. Um, I have to confess that I called Steve literally the minute I knew the exhibition was going to happen at the Bard Graduate um, Center. First of all, um, because he's the person who knows everything about graphic design, and so we should call Steve when we do anything about graphics. Um, but also because he was a contributor to Barbara Nessam's book, which is on sale in the gallery, and um, he wrote a, a very thoughtful essay about Barbara's work. So I wanted him to know that the exhibition was happening. But I also wanted to talk to him about organizing public programs in conjunction with the exhibition. And who better to ask than Steve Heller? Um, personally, I've known Steve for over 20 years, but today he reminded me that he has in his, his personal archive a letter that I wrote to him when I was first starting my career at the Brooklyn Museum. So it's way over 20 years. And I've had the opportunity to work with him on several occasions, including a really wonderful project um, that still exists in the world called Thoughts on Democracy, which we did in Miami Beach at the Wolfsonian. And Steve, of course, has been an advisor to me and many others on all things graphic. So for those not familiar with Steve's work, I will try to be brief, but be forewarned, it is nearly impossible. <laughs> for 33 years, Steve was an art director at the New York Times, first um, on the op edge page, and for nearly 30 years, um, with the New York Times Book Review. He is a prolific author, journalist, and blogger, and anyone who has 
any interest in the history of graphic design or graphic design today in studying graphic design has surely come upon his name, his work, and his many, many books. On the history of graphic design, his titles include Graphic Design History, Graphic Style from the Victorians to Postmodernism, Italian Art Deco, French Modern, European Art Deco, Cuba Style, another intersection we had back in Miami, and Times Square style. He has also addressed many themes in the graphic arts, from graphic humor, um, graphic wit, contemporary caricature. He also um, worked on books about totalitarianism, a book called Iron Fists, Branding the 20th Century Totalitarian State, and also Art Against War. He has also focused on key designers, people like Paul Rand, as well as key aspects of graphic design, such as typography and illustration. And here his books include Innovators of American Illustration, Handwritten Expressive Lettering in the Digital Age, and American Type Play. Um, Steve, of course, is also an educator and is the co-founder and co-chair of the MFA Design as author program at the School of Visual Arts, among many other things that he has done at the School of Visual Arts. And he has written books that focus on education and design. And these include The Education of a Graphic Designer, The Education of a Photographer, The Anatomy of Design, Design Literacy, Understanding Graphic Design, and The Design Entrepreneur, Turning Graphic Design into Goods That Sell. Because of Steve's deep and broad knowledge, he has also written, I love this the most, many, many obituaries <laughs> of designers and illustrators, but it's an extraordinary list because it shows you the depth of his knowledge and many book reviews and reviews of popular culture that appear in many places, print magazine, the New York Times, the Atlantic, and many others. And with all of this under what he's not wearing tonight, his New York Yankee cap. Um, he has also been recognized with many, many awards and honors um, from the National Endowment of the Arts, from the Art Directors Club, for the a from the AIGA for Lifetime Achievement. Um, he will soon receive an award in Pilsen from the University of West Bohemia, um, which is an award from the, um, the Sutnar um, Faculty of Arts and Design. And of course, really most importantly, I think, um, he has received recognition from the Smithsonian and the Cooper Hewitt um, National Design Award for Design Mind. And that award is given in recognition of a visionary who has had a profound impact on design theory, practice, and public awareness, all of which Steve has had. And so um, Steve is a very, very special mind, and I am honored that he has agreed to host this panel tonight. So welcome, Steve. OK, you can all go home now. Uh, that was really extraordinary, Marianne. I uh, didn't expect that. I thought it would be. And here he is. What's his name? <laughs> Uh, I co-chair co and co-founded the MFA Designer as Author Program with Lita Tellerico, who's in the back there. Um, we're here tonight in part to celebrate <laughs> Barbara Nessam. Her extraordinary retrospective exhibition reveals how and why she is one of the pioneers of conceptual illustration and graphic commentary that made such an editorial mark during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Barbara's exhibition is a perfect peg from which to hang various issues about art, commerce, politics, and culture. And tonight, we'll discuss the past and future, and most important, the present of illustration as a viable form of expression and a decent way to make a living. To set the stage, I'm going to list a few thoughts. Illustration is a shifting form. Advertising was once the mainstay for most illustrators. Then, as that gave way to TV and photography, editorial took over. With the new technologies and digital platforms, illustration activity is moving elsewhere. Our speakers, Barbara, Peter DeSeve, and George Bates, each with impressive credentials, will discuss where that elsewhere is or may be. 
Is illustration still a complement to others' words, or is it closer to what is often called fine art? Graphic novels, video games, animation, and even textiles and toys are illustrated products that have enabled illustrators to develop their own content independent sometimes of a client. What we want to get at tonight is the breadth of new and old opportunities for these and other artists. And there will be meaningful and will it be meaningful and profitable uh, a life, that is, after illustration is over, if it is ever over. It is also an opportunity to hear three exceptionally talented people talk about how they communicate their respective visions and points of view. We're going to see and hear evolutionary <coughs> presentations, but before we do, let me introduce them one at a time and uh, then call them up. Barbara Nessam is one of the pioneers of conceptual editorial illustration, and during the 1960s, she had the distinction of breaking ground in the gender department without even knowing she was doing it. Entering a virtual men's club was not easy, yet her distinctly metaphoric illustration approach and ethereal style hit the right chords during a period when art and design and illustration, uh, not to mention politics, morals, and mores, were in the vortex of change. Certain art directors, such as Henry Wolfe at Harper's Bazaar, Robert Benton at Esquire, and Stan Mack at the New York Herald Tribune's magazine appreciated Nessam's uniqueness and felt willing to take the chance. This period around the early 70s was when her self-confidence really emerged. In the early 80s, she was among the first to use digital media for making art. As she said to me a moment ago, everybody thought she was crazy because the computer wasn't going to last. <laughs> and another feat, today she makes creative use of both analog and digital. Peter DeSeve also has roots in the editorial genre, and his covers are familiar to New Yorker readers. His work spans three decades and includes all media. Over the past decade, his character designs have been at the core of three Ice Age films, and they're truly wonderful, including the famous Scrat that he created, and he's contributed imaginative work to the films Mulan, A Bug's Life, Tarzan, and Finding Nemo all worth seeing tonight when you go home and check into Netflix. <laughs> and George Bates, who will be our first speaker, started as an editorial illustrator and has since worked for clients like Mo Virgin Mobile, New York Times, where I worked with him many years ago, MTV Nickelodeon, Sony Music, and The Wall Street Journal, among others. He has two permanent public installations for the uh, NYC MTA, the subway, He's also an adjunct professor of illustration at the school of, uh, at Parsons School of Design. He teaches a sketchbook class, which he adores, and I'm sure the students do too, and has also previously taught illustration at Pratt Institute. So let's welcome George Bates. Thank you. Um, I have to say, uh, when I got out of school, uh, the, first, the first week, all of my professors were like, take your book up to see Steve Heller. And Steve went through my book, and I tell my students this, and he said, uh-huh, uh-huh, no, uh-huh, uh-huh, no. And he closed the book, and he said, the point of your portfolio is to show me how to use you. And I have to say, that set me up. That was the first portfolio review I ever had. I'm thankful for that. It set up my entire career. Um, so... I'm going to be condensing uh, 24 years of illustration history into about 10 minutes. So I'm going to be talking fast um, and covering a lot, and I'm going to be missing a lot. Um, but so as I mentioned, I've been an illustrator, a commercial artist illustrator for 24 years now. And in light of the topic uh, tonight, um, people have always asked me, well, how have you done this for 24 years in, in this sort of like shifting current of this field? And the question is, um, what is your business model? And the answer is always that it's extremely experimental and intuitive um, based on risk and assessment. And as I understand it, that's really the definition of what an entrepreneur is, is someone who's willing to take on risk. Um, so I'm going to jump right ahead to uh, when I became cognizant of 
uh, the graphic world around 1973, 74. Uh, my dad was an illustrator in the 60s, and he was also an art edu educator for the rest of his life. So there was an overwhelming amount of influence in the house. Um, and these are just some of the samples. And it went from highbrow to lowbrow. And I think you'll see it in the, uh, these influences in the subsequent presentation. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead to right after art school. This is the first op-ed piece I did for the art director, Mirko Ilich at the time in the early 90s. Now, when Mirko saw my portfolio, um, he seemed to be a fan of the work. And after he went through my portfolio, he said to me, he said, when you work for me, you draw little monsters as concepts. And I was like, this is absolutely perfect. Um, Mirko was a fan of my work. Uh, the editors at the op-ed page were not. Um, as I was dropping off a piece one day, Mirko went into the editor's office and he, uh, I could hear them fighting, literally. And they were like, we are not gonna be publishing this crap. And he said to you guys, screw you guys, this is really good illustration, this is a strong illustration. He came back in the room, he told me he had killed men in uh, Serbia and that he would fight for illustration. <laughs> this is a true story. And I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> like being an illustrator is fantastic. Um, and then after Mirko left years later, um, the new art director said to me, um, I really love your work. I love this sketch. I can show it to no one up here. He's like, things have gotten incredibly conservative. This is about like 91. And he's like, if you're going to continue to work for the New York Times, you have to rethink how you approach illustration entirely. Um, so I rethought it. And I had a bit of a golden era with, uh, with an art director, uh, Peter Buchanan Smith. And this is, a, for me, it's like the pinnacle of my editorial career. Um, this is a piece. They had sent me a fax and they said to me, you cannot tell anyone that you're gonna be doing this piece, it's gonna be national news tomorrow. And this is an op-ed by Yasser Arafat about, well, both one of the most polarizing figures at the time and also one of the most polarizing um, topics of then and now and probably forever, the Israeli-Palestinian situation. And I can talk so much about this piece, but what I will say is that um, I had been at a party a couple weeks before, and we were talking about this situation, and a friend said something that he knew would offend everyone in the room. He said, um, the Israeli-Palestinian situation is like two children who cannot play with the same toy, and therefore no one should get it until they can do this in a friendly manner. And then he said, and it's also about real estate. And you know, the argument, yeah, just blew up the room, a lot of hatred and vitriol. Um, but I think that this really serves to illustrate uh, what I think illustration is really good at doing. I think illustration can um, use reality avoidance to really comment on aspects of reality in a really thoughtful way. And if you look really closely at it, you'll see that I've taken his metaphor and used it almost directly. But like I said, this is an incredibly sensitive topic. and. With Peter Buchanan Smith, I had become known as the guy who can handle really sensitive topics without pissing anyone off, which was really counter to my original experience um, <laughs> with the New York Times. But uh, here, I'm going to jump ahead to um, all of my teachers were like editorial, editorial, editorial. And when we were making money and making a living, they were like, how the hell are you doing this? Editorial pays nothing. And this is something that wasn't really discussed in school. So uh, this is sort of a long story, but all of these are. I will, I will make them as brief as possible. Um, I had taken my book up to um, Viacom, and I became known as the guy who can draw and paint anything for all of their networks, uh, MTV, uh, Nickelodeon, TV Land. And they would ask me, can you do animations? Can you do products? Can you do typography? And I was like, of course, I can draw and paint anything. Um, and it was a really great time because it was the 90s. There were tons, it, like there was so much optimism. Budgets were incredibly good and it was a great time to be freelance. Um, and this is one of these things where this really helped support my, if you will, habit as an editorial illustrator. Um, now I'm gonna jump ahead to um, my sketchbooks. Like, when I was in art school, um, we were really encouraged to kind of like get craft out of the way 
to get at a more kind of like direct or interesting or even kind of ugly sort of mode of expression that kind of like incites a different sort of way of thinking. And so for the sketchbooks, for me, they always represented um, research and development. And um, I have to say, it's like a weird compulsion and it's a weird love, uh, these books, and it's definitely opened certain doors. Um, so I show this piece because this really typifies sort of uh, the best of like the sketchbook work that I got and the doors that it opened. Um, this, I was given a cassette by Tommy Boy and the first song on this album, um, the Prince Paul sings, it's a beautiful night to kill crackers. It's a beautiful night for a date rape. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's like taking all of these um, sort of gangster rap and hip hop sort of modes and like turning them on their head into really interesting sort of dialogue. And I was like, I have to work on this record. <laughs> and uh, they said that Prince Paul said, let this guy do whatever he wants after they, I, they saw the sketchbooks. Um, and I can tell you that this particular job, um, so many people have referenced it over the years. So here we are jumping ahead to the MTA stuff. And here I want to talk a little bit about uh, risk and, and what it means to kind of like take these risks. Um, I do this work like that drawing in the upper left I did on a subway car when I was just sitting there sort of like waiting for the train to move. And uh, it was one of these things where I was like, oh shit, now I have to finish it. It's going to take forever. But I knew that it would factor into other things. And I've used it for a couple different jobs. But what happened was, and how I got this gig, was that the, uh, the art director at the AMTA typed in Brooklyn surfer artist into Google. And my name came up because I have some surf art on a website in England. <laughs> He's like, that's how I found you. And so like, the point of this and like I said early on with like risk is just like, just do good work, get it out there any way you can. And eventually somebody with money, hopefully, uh, will see it and you'll get paid for it. And like I said, that's kind of been my, my business model. Um, and then this is the second subway piece that I did for the MTA. Uh, this one is realized in, uh, in cut steel. And I think that uh, illustrators are just really good at public art. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So I wanted to kind of finish out with um, where things are now. This is a job that I just finished last week. Uh, we did 24 sort of little vignettes about, uh, this is for Campari, Argentina. And um, the thinking was we created these little illustrations for 24 different cocktail recipes. And I like the idea of what it means to be a fan of something. I like how uh, being a fan of something is sort of like this abstract adherence to what something good is and how brands try to connect to their audience and build trust. So that to me um, is where I really enjoy using illustration thinking. Um, so as you see, it's gonna be a book. It was definitely a flask. Um, and just to create like an environment and, and space all surrounded by with the ideas of like what illustration thinking is. Um, this is another branding job and this, this is funny because the creative director was a huge fan of that Prince Paul record and the art director that I got, he's like, I love that freaking record. I sat in my bedroom and got high and like just like looked at that cover for hours. He's like, this is the art direction for it. And he gave me three modes uh, to think about. He said, first of all, I want you to piss off the suits at the company. <laughs> and he said, second of all, he said, I want the person who works at this company for the rest of their life to like see something new in it every day. And the third thing, he goes, and I want to make sure that not everyone likes them. So I think we did pretty good with that. Um, and we did three of these. Um, and then this is another sort of branding job where this is the second year that I've worked with La Marzocco, the espresso machine maker. Um, last year, they flew me out to Italy to spend time in Florence. It was horrible. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have to say, for all this branding stuff, like I'm in a, I'm in a unique position now where I can tell uh, creative directors and, and owners of company that there will be no sketches. Just tell me what to do, and I'll just do it. Um, so he said to me, he's like, the only thing that we need is we need images that can help us 
uh, put forth the idea that we're a global family, and that was it. We did about like 18 of these that should be in a book out next year. So the other place where my illustration thinking is, is that I started just recently a company with my wife, um, a multidisciplinary design agency, uh, to try and reach out to different uh, clients. Because for me, like helping clients solve a problem has always been really kind of fascinating. Um, and then here is where I will end. Um, the public art thing has opened up these sort of strange doors into the fine art world. And I was at the gallery when a couple bought this piece. And it was really something, because it was not cheap. And I was like, well, why do you want it? <laughs> and, and the response was, he said, it reminds me of Guernica without the violence. And she said, it, I love movement. And I just love the movement of the thing. And to think that somebody was going to spend money on something that they're going to have forever, you want it to kind of be new and fresh every day. And I think it just may achieve that. But this also like illustrates the difference in how I think about the difference between illustration and fine art. And I'd say like illustration is about telling the story and fine art is about deepening the mystery. And for me, these days, I'm interested in both, but I'll tell you, the mystery seems really appealing suddenly. So. How big is that? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's <laughs> It's mixed. It's archival. Um, I definitely worked on with some inks that were not, and I was like, I cannot sell this. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's all. You see that? That's a picture. Can we lower the lights? Yeah, sure. Oh. You know, I have to say, I'm uh, a little bit caught short here because um, I thought I was supposed to bring about five slides and then we'd start talking. <laughs> that was an amazing presentation. Your work is fantastic. So, um, uh, and I do have about five slides and a little, and a little um, short animated film. Um, but in brief, I. Um, I went to school, Parsons School of Design. I, I graduated in uh, 1980. Um, I grew up on comics and illustrated. I just loved paperback covers. I was I, I, I always gravitated towards illustration. I was a big fan of illustration uh, before I knew what an illustrator was. Um, and I went to Parsons, graduated, and uh, and went straight into editorial illustration, and and did that for for many years. I worked for everybody. I, I started very small. I started in black and white, tiny little black and white spots. Back then, you could actually almost scrape together a living doing that. Um, I did that because a little bit of a detour, but uh, because I'm colorblind which is not to say that the world isn't black and white, but I get confused by certain shades of red and green, stuff like that. Anyway, it got better. Um, so uh, I, did, uh, I was an editorial illustrator for, for many years, and um, I'd say if, if my work had, uh, had any common thing running through it, it's always been character-based. It's always been about who's inhabiting the picture and, and telling that story through those, those people or creatures or whatever they were. And uh, one, uh, one year, and I guess it was about 1993, something like that, I uh, illustrated a, uh, a sort of a quasi-animated uh, fairy tale called, uh, a excuse me, a folk tale called uh, Finn McCool, which is an Irish folk tale about a giant. And although it wasn't full-on animation, it was more like a glorified animatic where the camera moves across an image and there's background music and there's a narrator and everything else. Um, based on that, uh, a producer at, uh, at Disney uh, saw that and invited me to do character designs for The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, they mostly ignored those 
designs, but it <laughs> began my career in, uh, in animation. So for a long time, I had this kind of two-headed career uh, where I was an illustrator who sometimes did character design. Um, these days, it's really more like I'm a character designer who occasionally does illustration. And almost exclusively now, um, I, every now and then a book cover will come up. I never do editorial work anymore. I was in the trenches for years, and it was fantastic training for thinking and, and drawing uh, quickly. Um, most jobs were, many were overnight. Some I had a couple of days, but it, uh, it was a great uh, trial by fire, and I learned so much during that time. But, uh, but now I, I just, I do my occasional New Yorker cover, and uh, here are a few of them. Uh, this one is called uh, A New Leaf. <laughs> now, I'm going to guess. Uh, which arrow do I Let's try this arrow. It worked. Um, this is called Just a Pinch. <laughs> and uh, I love doing New Yorker covers. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, uh, it's, uh, it certainly has uh, a, a large audience, but forever it's been one of the very few places, and now I'd say one of the only places, where an artist can do an image that stands on its own and does not have to have anything to do with the content uh, of the magazine. It's not, it's not really illustrating anything inside, it's illustrating, uh, at its best, it's illustrating uh, some perspective that, uh, that the artist uh, wanted to, uh, to talk about and draw a picture about. So I find them very personal, and uh, each one is a little bit of a, a love letter to New York or a dig at New York. Um, but it's, uh, it's always a big deal to, uh, to sit down and do one. There's a little bit of panic. Sometimes uh, I have, every now and then, there's, uh, there's a quick deadline, like I really have to do this overnight, and that brings me back to my life as an editorial illustrator, and I'm ready for it. And in fact, there's a certain liberation, I think, when you have a gun to your head. It's like, I can't nitpick. I can't fuss with this thing. I just have to do it. And um, terror can be very inspiring. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that's uh, just a pinch. Um, this one, uh, I don't think it's, it, I, I did it uh, just a couple of weeks ago. It's called uh, Something Familiar. Um, and uh, it's not going to run um, uh, because uh, I, I submit, actually, I, I usually just do a sketch, and Francoise Mouly, the art director there, will say, well, um, you know, work on it or don't work on it or whatever. Um, Usually it's, it dies at that stage, but this sketch, I just had it for years and I always wanted to do it. And uh, I figured I should just do it as a finish. And I did it as a finish. And, uh, and she said, I don't think Remnick's gonna like it. I think it's, maybe it's too cute. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it is a little cute. It's a cute kitty cat, but I still like it. Um, but anyway, she said, but the good news is that um, uh, we, uh, we're going to run something else, and it's, uh, it's, it's this. And I had done a, a sketch um, for this, and this comes out on Monday. You're the first people to see this cover. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I showed it to you. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the title I suggested was Hip Hops, but I don't know if it was. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right thing to do. Um, so anyway, so the other, my other head of the, the other career is this character design thing, which has really come to eclipse my editorial stuff. But I'm very happy to continue to do the, those, those drawings. Um, but the character design is a great thing for me. It's, um, it gets to... Uh, it gets to a purer kind of drawing for me. I love, I, I, I collect a lot of original art, mostly illustrators from the, you know, from uh, the 20th, early 20th, before that. Um, 
great, uh, uh, great comic draftsmen, uh, a lot of them. Um, I can only afford the sketches, which is okay, because those are the best drawings, really. Those the, it's the loose stuff. It's the stuff where the artist is trying to figure it out, and you see the scratches and the detours, and you see the thing that they decided not to do. And it's not the finish, which so often just dies on the table. I know this very well. Um, so to, uh, to be able to actually have a career which is all about doodling, which is all about sketching, what about this, uh, is, is great. And it's, it's really fun because I, I, you know, it's either right or wrong. It's, and, and, and really, I'm just, uh, it's just doodling. Uh, and it happens at the earliest stage of, a, uh, of, uh, of an animated feature. It's the, it's the what if stage. It's here's the, uh, here's the script, here's the description of the character, um, go. And so then I just uh, do lots and lots of drawings until um, the director and I think maybe, maybe there's something there. So uh, this is a character named Buck. He's, uh, he was in the third, uh, the third Ice Age movie. There are actually, now I, I don't remember how many there are. Maybe there's five. I don't know. But it, I have two kids in private school, so keep making it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I actually, I, I love this franchise. I love to work on it. I, it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's an incredible opportunity, really, because the, uh, the, the structure of an animated film is, you know, it begins here, you know, with a couple of people doing, uh, you know, writing the story, the director, a couple of story people, a character designer, and then it just gets wider and wider and wider, and there are a million people, that there are 300, 400 people that work together by the end of the film to create this thing. But it begins with just a few people uh, early on. Um, so at this point, no, no decisions have been made, and it's, it's really a delightful part of the process. So this is Buck. He's a survivalist weasel. He's a little insane. He spent too much time alone. Um, and this is one of the first drawings I did of him. And it's, uh, that doesn't usually happen. Usually it takes many, many drawings to get to a character. But this kind of felt right. And then uh, I'll draw him in context, and I'll draw him that he's, he's, he lives in this world that's populated by dinosaurs. And, uh, and these little things that are just fun to draw can often be, uh, and they might hang a whole scene on it. And, and it's so early in the process that it's almost part of the writing process. Because although the writer, the director, they might have a sense of who this character is, once they start to see drawings of him, it starts to inform the way they think about that character, and it sometimes wags the dog. Sometimes they think, oh, I know what this character would do. I know what he would say. Oh, you know who, what voice, what actor would be perfect for this guy? So this is even, I do these drawings without the actor in mind. So it all becomes, um, when everything's all thrown together, it becomes something you know, uh, greater than the sum of its parts. It's really fun. Uh, so I move them around. and. We do, uh, uh, I do studies of their expressions. Uh, I don't think I included them here, but we also, it goes down a pipeline where we have to create a sculpture of this character, because most of these films are 3D, where you know, it's computer generated, so the characters are volumetric. They're, they're almost like sculptures. And so this requires me to think beyond the 2D and to think volumetrically, and it's, I love that. I've sort of discovered a love of sculpture as I uh, got deeper into this career. Uh, that's Simon Pegg. He's the guy that eventually voiced uh, this character, Buck. That's what he looked like when he was totally done and rendered. <laughs> now, you would think, hey, now would be a great time to see a clip with this character. <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> uh, I have a clip with a totally different character. Um, but he's, uh, he's probably the most popular one of the franchises called the Scrat. He's a squirrel obsessed with a nut that he can never get. And he's like <laughs> everybody in this room. Um, so now, Melissa, could we get to the, we're, we couldn't play the clip off the PowerPoint, so we just have to get out of PowerPoint, press play. And uh, this is the, this is the first scene, or it's actually the trailer for the fourth movie called Continental Drift. 
And uh, what they usually do for the trailers for the Ice Age movies is they make it sort of a little film unto itself. Um, so can we go full screen? That was great. <laughs> anyway, um, I've been working for 54 years in my profession of being an illustrator. And as Steve said, I was one of the first women uh, in the new age of 1960. And I didn't know I was one of the women who were, was going, I was, that I was like one of few. There must have been others, I, do, I don't know them. But you're, you go around and you take your portfolio around and you try and get work. But I always had, not always, but in the beginning I had a part-time job as an illustrator, as a textile designer. So while I did illustration and tried to get work, I would always try and make some kind of money so I could pay the rent. So I always thought that was really important. And this is from 1967 when I first started doing these drawings with writing underneath it. I couldn't do the drawing unless I had the writing underneath it and I had some kind of border. So, so a lot of things were very compulsive. <laughs> and I must have done about 100 of these, maybe more. And you can see the way the, um, the, the whole back, the whole design from the border influence work when I do commercial work. So a lot of work that I do for myself is seen in my commercial work. Dion Moore poster, I took the border and integrated within her portrait. And also, you have to work with a lot of constraint, at least I had to work with a lot of constraint, which is, that's a three color poster. So how do I do a three color uh, a print run? It's not four color, which would have been more expensive. So one of the colors was black. The other color where you, in the printing, printer or the printing machine, you have a trough. And I put, not me, the printer, blue to dark, to dark blue to light blue to the other blue in there. And then the third time it went through the press, it was orange going into brown, going into green, and to blue in the end. So it went through the press three times, but you had the feeling that it was full color. And that was fun to work out in my head. My Woman Girl series, which I did probably hundreds of these drawings as well, and these are watercolors about this big, and it was about women being present but not being in control so she doesn't have her hands. Her hands are separate. Like, where are my hands? I, I must have left them somewhere. And uh, the fact of the, the ribbon going through my work, I love dancing and I love uh, the rhythm of just art and just dancing and everything. So ribbons play a big role in what I do. And translating it to illustration it was the first. It was the first issue of Ms. Magazine, and this is a story called "Woman in Madness." And so I took the ribbon. I wanted to split her head and put her upside down, and just make this whole rhythm thing coming out. And people thought you were crazy if you did whatever you wanted to do, and they thought Ma Ms. Magazine, Harry Reisner thought that Ms. Magazine wouldn't last six months. <laughs> it's now 40 years or more. So you knew that there was an issue about how people, how women perceived women and how men perceived women. Love shoes. I designed shoes in uh, 1973. I went to Italy. It was terrible. <laughs> I remember Italy as being kind of nice. <laughs> and 
And uh, so I did the, all these crazy shoes and I got the cover of Audience Magazine. I had done uh, a present for Milton Glaser, who they, Milton and Shirley were good friends of mine. And I did a whole bunch of shoes and gave it to him as a birthday present and all of a sudden it was on the cover of Audience Magazine. Of course he called me and asked me. And then I had a shoe in the back and a shoe in the front and he's, somebody called me up and said, how would you like to design shoes? And I said, well, I never did it before, but hey, I'm up for anything. So I went to Italy and designed shoes. And then the shoes that I had done, not the real shoes, but the fantasy shoes, then became when Vanity Fair was reissuing uh, I, 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 1983. They asked me to do the cover for it, me, one of many artists. My work didn't get on it, but I decided to, to do a shoe. But the way my work that I do for myself always informs the work I do for publication. That's where my inspiration comes from, my sketchbooks. And I'm never without one. This is 94. <laughs> and uh, it, it's someplace where I'm, I'm, I work all the time in it. And I just keep doing them. And when I have a job to do, always go to my sketchbooks. And you can see how they look. And, and people ask, how do they look so finished? Well, I don't make them look finished. They just come out looking that way. And another sketchbook. And that influenced a job that I did for Mademoiselle Magazine. Cover for Time was about, they asked seven women to do something about the women's movement. Anything you want to do, and I love those jobs where they say anything you want to do because what it really means is that you do something and then I'll see if I like it or not because I have no idea of what I want. <laughs> so, so you go in and you do something and you think, oh my God, I, I want more direction, please. But no, anything you want to do. So I thought about, they said you can do about the women's movement from the past, from the, from the future, whatever you think. I thought, okay. It's about all women, black women, white women, like black and white. And then I thought, well, I think that it was, it was in 1982 and the ERA was just about to be ratified. We only had three more states to get the Equal Rights Amendment, which we still don't have. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to put her up here, three more states. And she'll only have three more steps to go to the blue sky, blue sky metaphor. It didn't get passed, and I put it back down to go. I made her much smaller, a, a little. This is the, the hill of, that she's coming from, and now the steps are very big that she has to climb. And as I said, it would be about all women, black and white, and every color in between. And so she's. These are, this is like the sweat and the hard time and that it took for the 10 years to get the ERA just in front of uh, Congress. And, but she's sad, but she's going to get the ERA passed at some point in the future, we hope. <laughs> this was for dining and living in LA and it was a magazine that LA Style put out. Um, so, the, and it also became the cover of American Illustration, which it, uh, is a kind of a, a compendium of work that was done in a year that you put your work into, and if it gets chosen, you get into the magazine, but they use mine as the cover, so that's American Illustration 6. But what I was thinking of dining and living in LA is that uh, here is this very, very sophisticated woman, and she's sitting by the pool ordering her, her lunch or whatever, but she doesn't realize she has the blue plate special on her hat. <laughs> so she's like, she doesn't realize that she's just nowhere. And 1982, or 1980 actually, I was invited to MIT to learn about computer graphics. And I thought, oh, computers and art, my goodness. But I couldn't go right at that moment 
And I kept asking people, do you know anything about computers and art? No one knew anything. Computers and art? What about computers and art? So it took two years for me to find a computer in New York. And that was a secret enclave up at Time Video Information Systems um, under the umbrella of Time Incorporated. And I went, I could, I was allowed to go there every night from five o'clock at night to nine in the morning and I taught myself how to use computers. And this is an example of computers work from that time. And I had six colors, six uh, uh, modes, and a, uh, six grays. Is this a print, uh, a screenshot or a, that's a, that's a, a print? That's a screenshot, but it came from a print. And you could see it was 199 by 256 was the resolution. And you can see all the, they call them the jaggies, these little things coming like that. But, you know, I, I managed to kind of still do something that was, that came from me, which was amazing. And when the School of Visual Arts in 1986 decided to put in, it was very forward thinking then, a computer graphics program uh, in, in the school, they asked me to do the poster for it for the subway. And I got a call from Rolling Stone to do a portrait of John Lennon. I'm always very shy about doing portraits because I don't feel like I do them well. And it's always like agonizing. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. But if it doesn't look right, you don't have to pay me and you can ask somebody else. But give me enough time so that I'm gonna give it to you in the, like in three days, and then you have three days to ask somebody else, because I never thought I could do it. And I, I started thinking about John Lennon, and I got the, uh, some, had to be John Lennon eight years after his assassination, and so I thought, okay, he died a violent death, so I made red for the blood, and blue for the sky, because he's no longer here. I had to make him a little bit older, like, you know, put some age on him and as if he were still here. And I just left this whole part empty because he's not here anymore. He's here and not here, here with his music and not here. And, uh, oh, and no, he said, one caveat, Yoko Ono has to approve it. And I said, okay. <laughs> well, she loved it, obviously. So I was glad about that, but I don't find these easy to do. And this is for Levi's, it was these large pieces that were in Times Square being shown. I don't know if I have one of them. No, I didn't put it in. Uh, and I, I took Andrew Wyeth's uh, Christina's World, and I usually don't use references like that, but this is one time I used it. And I did a whole series, probably about seven pieces for them, and it was on billboards and magazines everywhere. And breast cancer in 35, well, okay, what am I gonna do for that? Then I always get the jobs where if the art director doesn't know really what they wanna do or what they can do, uh, or something about sex and, uh, and you can't show the sex or you can't, do, have to do the metaphor. So, okay, breast cancer, 35. Now, what do I show? I'm not allowed to show breast, really, um, so what do I do? So I thought, okay, I started drawing a few things, and then I thought, maybe just a simple line. And then I had to think about, well, a 35-year-old breast, is it up, is it down? <laughs> What's a 35-year-old breast look like? And you know, these are things that you have to consider. And then it was the nipple. Like, can I show the nipple, or can I not show the nipple? So they said, don't worry. You can show the nipple, okay? I can show the nipple, that's good. <laughs> and I decided to do a, a, a colored line because it was about breast cancer and all women, any, any color. And I brought it in and the woman, the art director called me up and she goes, well, I don't know. The editor looked at it and he's, he, he was concerned about the nipple. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I asked you about the nipple. I mean, like. <laughs> 
I don't know, I can do a breast without a nipple. And then about, I, I, she says, you have to come in. So I was just getting ready to go, go in. They call me back and go, it's okay, it's okay. He's okay with the nipple. <laughs> okay, I got the nipple. But it was simple, so simple. And it was, this is one of the covers that everybody remembers. Is that, is that watercolor? Hmm? Was watercolor. That watercolor. Oh no, that was a 50-50. That was um, computer. I took uh, the breast and I put it in the computer and then I, I made it uh, in the computer the color. And now what I'm doing are large, besides doing my own work uh, and having an exhibition here at the Bard, uh, I, I, I'm doing large scale work for residential lobbies. And this is one for, um, it's a place right outside Rockefeller Center. It's 48, uh, 18 West 48th Street. <laughs> and so I decided to take the theme of, of what Rockefeller Center was, is, uh, and I'm, I can't explain it exactly, but uh, that was for the Christmas tree. You can't really see it. It was about the story of Christmas. And this was the Madonna and she has her hands up and the baby Jesus is someplace over here that you don't see. And these are the three wise men. I don't know if you could see that. And the Christmas tree is over here. And the whole thing has to do with the story of Christmas because it was right by Rockefeller Center and where they have the Christmas tree every <coughs> year. I decided to take that as the theme for the residential building. And it's, this is computer generated as well and it's done in, each one is done in three panels, wherever this thing is. Three panels here and three panels here. And how you hang it and was, we hung it on cleats, it had to really be right. So it was, it was successful. And this was for the same building. Then they said, oh, we have something that we're gonna put vending machines in there. Oh. And, then, and then they decided, no, no, no. I think we're gonna do something for the mail room. So I said, okay. And I had to do it like almost overnight. So I looked, uh, I took the dictionary, the mail room, okay, that words, you know? So I took a dictionary and I opened it up and I pointed and I opened it up and pointed and I looked, read the word and my assistant wrote it down. And we had these lists of words. So then I looked at the words from the dictionary and I thought, okay, um, what about communication? Let, let me circle all the words that have something to do with communication. And this is what happened. So it says, gray matter decided. So you're thinking about writing a letter or writing something to someone. And I can't read that, sorry. Personal <laughs> yeah, oh, personal number is your address. Uh, conduit of luck, you could win lotto. Uh, it, it, it could be something that, I don't know, a comfort corner, you could be reading a love letter, you know, and being, or a letter from your kid or something. And it's, it could be device, device, divisive. And then the next day, it's new. So that was my whole thing about letters for the mail room, as you can see. And then, this is in the Condé Nast building, but I was asked to do something for the Aventi Hotel. And th this is how big it is, 20, 28, inches, 28 feet by 12 feet. And I was thinking it's built as a classic hotel. So I thought, okay, what's classic? Greek and Roman sculpture, that's classic. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the Met, and I took photographs. I spent a whole day there to, with a point-and-shoot camera taking photographs. I knew that I wanted something looking up and somebody looking down because it was on two floors. This, this is the sketch for it, but it's printed on aluminum. This is printed on paper. And the, the uh, floor, the third floor is here, the fourth floor is here, and they had like a, a some kind of, uh, bay opening in, so you could look down. You could never see the whole thing at once. This, um, I feel lucky that I have this photograph because here I can see the whole thing once, but in the hotel, you only see part of it, and you see part of it, you have to go to different floors to see it. So it's more experiential rather than seeing it like this. And I call it Chronicles of Beauty. And it's one piece, and then I did 
12 pieces, four feet by four feet, all printed on aluminum. So they have this like really, really nice feeling to it. So I did a collage bringing beauty from now, from 3,000 years ago, mashing it up together. And now I'm working on, from my sketchbooks, I'm blowing them up really, really big on a, a huge printer. And these are some pieces from it. And this I just took, you see the same scarf, today in my studio, because I said, well, you can't tell how big they are. So I wanted you to see how big they are now. And that's kind of what I'm working on right now. And that's it. Gee, I'm sorry I didn't become an illustrator, <laughs> but I wasn't very good. But I tried. Um, I know that m most of you must have questions for the presenters, and uh, I have a couple that I just want to get out right away, and then I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, but this was really wonderful. It's, I had no idea what to expect and I was just transfixed. It could go on for many more hours, but there's something on TV I have to watch. <laughs> uh, George mentioned uh, the risk. And so the question I wanna ask of all of you is, what was your risk? What is it that was risky for you that you did, that you just took a deep breath and did what you had to do and it worked out, or it didn't work out for that matter. Some risks don't work. Yeah. George, you want to start? All right. Um, I didn't want to do this. Um, <laughs> I moved to New York City not knowing how to play an instrument. I wanted to join a band and tour the world. Um, and I was in so many bands. Um, and I had to finally quit bands because the illustration thing was just going so well. Um, it was always kind of like a a side hustle thing. I mean, I was serious about the fact that I love the arts, but I was so much more drawn to music. So I'd say just in general, um, like I said, a lot of our teachers, there were two people from my program who actually made a living at illustration. And they were like, how are you guys doing this? And uh, because they were all kind of guys who were like, when Playboy stopped playing like a thousand dollars or a quarter page, I stopped working. And you know, editorial rates for years have gone down and down. And we were trained as editorial illustrators generally, um, but we just said that, oh, we were kind of, I mean, like you even said it, you're like, I know how to draw and paint, I know how to think, there's nothing I can't do in, the, in that regard. So we were just really kind of open. And I'd say the <coughs> arrogance of youth was really on our side. And yeah. now how old are you? Uh, 46. Have you learned, <laughs> learned your lesson? Yeah, oh gosh, time machine, sign me up. I'll, I'll go back and do it right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The, in, the, George was in my program and uh, No, no, I was, Parsons. I graduated in 90. Oh, I taught so, in your program, yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah. oh. We missed each other by like oh. a year, which is so oh, sad. Oh, that's interesting. It's really sad. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. And you thought he just was absent from your class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. Yeah. Well, I, you were teaching in my program. Yeah. yeah. And I loved his sketchbooks. I thought that they were just amazing. So, uh, so risk. Is that risk? Um, You've taken a number well, of them. I, I don't know. I never felt like I was risking anything. You know, I, what, I think that what happened was I lived at home for the first two years of my illustration life because I felt like I, I couldn't, I, I knew what I wanted to do. But I didn't want to go out and get an apartment. And I felt like I had to save money. So I saved $5,000 in 1960 to 62. And that was a lot of money then. And that was my cushion, $5,000 in the bank. Never touch it. Never <laughs> even look at it. It doesn't even belong to you. 
And then I could go out and just be me. And without really, oh, and then I, my sister decided, she, we have to move out. My sister's two and a half years younger than me. Barbara, let's move out. We don't want to stay here. Let's move out. And I said, oh, I don't know. It's fine here. Don't know. Let's move out. I said, OK. So I move out. We're out. We got a one-room apartment. So I said, we, well, we can afford a one-room apartment. She goes, well, we live in this one room here. So we can live in one room. So I'd go out, and four months later, she didn't like it. She moved back home. So now I have an apartment. <laughs> I didn't realize I'm not moving back home. It was a big schlep moving down there. So uh, finally, uh, I, I have a friend. Um, I was going out with uh, Henry Wolf, and Henry Wolf was uh, uh, um, working at Esquire magazine, and Robert Benton was his assistant, and Robert Benton was going out with Gloria Steinem, and we used to double date all the time. And so Gloria said, oh, you need a roommate? How's about, I'll, I need to leave my apartment, so I'll move in with you. Are you OK with that? I said, yeah. I said, but you have to know one thing. I'm a little sloppy, and I'd like to stay up late at night. Fine. <laughs> so she moved in, and to, we lived together for six years. In this one room, we moved from there to another one room, and then we moved to an, another place. But we got along great. Nothing. You know, she did her thing, I did my thing, and uh, that's how I left. I mean, I didn't feel any risk ever right. because I had that five thousand dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and that was the secret. And when I didn't want to get married, that was the other thing. My father, you know, 1960, 19, you know, like I had a very nice boyfriend. He was studying to be a shrink. He became a shrink. Very nice guy. Was not getting married. And I think that that really, my father came from Turkey, my mother was born in Egypt, we're a Spanish Jewish, and like, he just didn't get why I wasn't going to marry Stanley. I mean, he was nice, and I loved him. Couldn't get it. So, but I, I was not a rebel, I was really a good girl. <laughs> Dad, don't worry, one day I will get married, but not now. So, that, that's kind of some something I had to deal with when I was trying to find my way in the world. I'm glad I came because I didn't know about Henry Wolf and Bob Benton. No, this no. is good. Twitter, yeah. anyone? <laughs> I didn't Peter? even know about the Gloria Steinem thing, so <laughs> I'm impressed. Peter? Um, you know, I'd like to sign up for that time machine thing, too, <laughs> because um, I, I would say that I... Uh, I was never much of a risk taker, and it's a miracle that I survived, really. Um, I, uh, it's, only, it's only in recent years that I, I think I've sort of developed a confidence in my work and, and uh, can trust the fact that a, that a, a simple drawing is a, is a beautiful thing and that it doesn't have to be a rendered finished piece, and it was hard, I think, for me to believe that there was virtue in, in a sketch or a doodle when, when I, 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 first, uh, I first started out. I was also, I think I mentioned, I was terrified of, of color, and, um, and so every piece was a risk. Every, every, every piece was uh, kind of terrifying. So how did you cope? You just did? Uh, I drank. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I took baby steps, you know. I, I, I just, I had to do it. I, had to, I couldn't remain a, a, a black and white artist. That was, that was just untenable and, and uh, unrealistic. And um, I sort of inched my way through it and did little, you know, little black and white drawings, and then little color drawings. And, and then I would, you know, magazines would start to hire me, better magazines, the New York Times Magazine, and then New York Magazine, and, and so on. And it graduated, and it, you know, it grew in a very organic way. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so now I have uh, all the confidence I needed then. And, uh, and so it's still, it's, it's actually kind of nice. It's sort of, uh, it, the adventure is still going. It's still continuing, which is kind of nice. It 
this ripe old age. <laughs> How old is ripe? I'm, I'll be 56 in December. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 75. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't feel 75, but you know, hey. It's the new 60. Yeah. <laughs> it's the new, I don't know what, but. My doctor told me today how old I was and I didn't believe him. Uh, so another question. Uh, there's a book out uh, of Andy Warhol's editorial work. Uh, beautiful book, actually. And it's all the things he did with all the art directors that you guys have been talking about, more or less. And at some point he said, enough of this already, and he painted his soup can. Uh, when did it dawn on you that editorial work was not the future? And was it really a sharp cut, or was it a transitional thing? Barbara, you, you said you were doing a lot of things at once, but you were known for your editorial work. Yeah, I, th I think that <clears throat> I always did a lot of things because even when I was doing my illustration right in the very beginning with etchings, I, 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 for the first five years I did a lot of etchings because it was black and white mostly. I did work for girly magazines because they were the only ones that would hire new illustrators in 1960. And the people buying the magazine didn't really care about the illustration. And so they had good they writers. They were reading the stories. <laughs> <laughs> the stories. Well, they had good writers and they had a, a good illustrators because they were just looking at the pictures. And only the pictures of the women were in color, but everything else was in black and white. So that's really where I started uh, doing my work and, and really understanding what illustration was. And the fact that I could do whatever I wanted to do, and then I went to Harper's Bazaar and Esquire and everything, and they saw, oh, a published piece. Maybe we can try her. But when did you, dis I mean, when did I there, there isn't a lot of illustration out that we see of yours now and what you showed. Yeah, because I don't do illustration now. I'm doing things for buildings, and I'm doing my own work because I, uh, I haven't even thought about illustration for many, many years. The last thing I did was the cover for David Bowie, the cover of the v &A magazine, because I had a show in the Victoria and Albert Museum last year, a single artist show. And the Victoria and Albert Mu Museum doesn't do single artist shows. Neither does the Bard, which, <laughs> which is the most amazing thing for me, because I'm just totally um, honored to have had had a show with the Victoria and Albert Museum. That's amazing. And, and also to have the show here at the Bard. But um, the only way that the Victoria and Albert Museum could have a show of mine was to own all the work, a oh. single artist show, because they still don't have the oh, single yeah. artist show. So they asked me if I'd be willing to donate my work to the museum. Hello, excuse me, I would love to because yeah. it's, to me, it's like they're, they are holding the work forever and ever. It's always being going to be taken care of. So I didn't know what exactly it was going to be, like a retrospective or what it turned out to be a retrospective, but I didn't know that. I thought maybe they were only interested in my digital work because Douglas Dodge, who's the curator of Word and Image, was the one who had asked me about it. And so I felt totally honored by that ask. And yes, yes, they could own my work. And I had to read the letter like a hundred times <laughs> to make sure that they couldn't have a show unless they owned the work. And could they own the work? I would have them own the work without even having the show. So. And now you have more space for more work. <laughs> well, I mean, you have so much work anyway. But the. They have work from 1960 to now, and that is what half of it is in the show at the bars now. Peter? Um, editorial, yeah, yeah. When, when did I realize um, editorial had, was, was fading out? Well, it, it, it required me to kind of look up from my, my animation work because, um, because I'd been, I, I was absolutely a, um, a dedicated, dyed in the wool editorial illustrator for, for decades, and, and I loved it. I loved, 
I love the fact that every time the phone rang, there could be a different client, and every time the phone rang, there was another, each piece was kind of a, a riddle um, and with, a, with a clock, with a stopwatch, and it's like, okay, figure this out now, and it was, uh, it was, it was actually great, and I, I, I miss it quite a bit, um, in a way. There, it was also hellish, and it's a, a young man's game. I lived, you know, I mostly functioned between 10 o'clock at night and, and Pink Dawn, as my friends in the network would call it. And the network was phone line, and we would talk to each other at 3 in the morning when Mary Tyler Moore was coming up, <laughs> and, uh, you know, on television. And that was a bad sign. If your piece wasn't well underway by the time Mary Tyler Moore came on, you're, you were screwed. <laughs> um, but I, I, I loved editorial, and, and, I, uh, and it, you know, now I, I look like a, a, a genius because I got into animation and I avoided what has become you know, a kind of uh, a debacle because it's, it's, all, it's all gone. Uh, but the fact is, it was, it was pure luck. It was timing. It was uh, right call at the right time. Um, and uh, I enjoyed doing both at the same time, but for, a, for after a while I realized I'm actually not doing that anymore. Uh, so it, it dawned on, to answer your question finally, it, uh, it just dawned on me slowly. You know, uh, after talking to friends, I have contemporaries who were doing the same thing and who hadn't moved on to something else, and they were suddenly looking up and thinking, Where's my living? Where's my livelihood? And uh, it it became uh, it really was time to either adapt or or perish. And and some people did. Some people just didn't make the jump. They didn't make they didn't sort of embrace the fact that the world is changing. It's a digital age now, and uh, it's a different uh, it's a different game. Um, so you really have to be nimble. Right. George, your uh, alternative? Um, this is funny because it dawned on me the minute I asked you how much to invoice for the first editorial job I ever did. And you told me, and I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how am I going to make a living doing this? Because nobody ever talked about this in school. Right. And it was funny yeah. about like the porn stuff, because like, I, I had a whole, I was working for the New York Times, um, and I was working for the string of porn magazines that the content was so X-rated, the only way that they could sell it is if they had a socially redeeming article in the background. <laughs> and there was this woman, and she was like smoking cigars. She's like, I love your shipmates. And she's like, do whatever you want. And I did all this really inventive, experimental stuff, but I was like, New York Times porn magazines? Like, this is all I can get. And then, um, you know, because I'd go to like GQ or whatever, they'd be like, we love your work, we have no idea what this stuff is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was that moment when I, I brought my portfolio to uh, Nickelodeon and, and the art director said, she's like, do you realize this is a children's network? And I was like, yeah, I figured I'd show it to you. And she was like this kind of goth chick and everything. And she was just like, you know what, you have type in here. Maybe we'll call you someday for something, because I love your work, but I don't know what it's going to be. So she called me uh, a week later and was like, we have this show, The Ren and Stimpy Show, can you do type for it? And then can you do characters? And like that first paycheck was in the several thousands, and I was like, fuck editorial. <laughs> <laughs> it was really one of these things that was just amazing, because it was just like, I would walk into these advertising meetings and like, how much do you want for this? And I once got paid $20,000 to do four line drawings. And then I was like, okay, now I'll go home and get to that deadline, you know, six in the morning, gotta have that piece ready and everything. And it was just like this weird sort of balance. But for me, the, the, the interest in the editorial has never died. Like when the New York Times still calls and they're like, we need a, we need a sketch by one o'clock and then a final by five. I'm, you know, sometimes I'm just really amped. But the thing about all this stuff though, like as an educator, there's always this ethical conundrum. It's like, how are we still teaching this thing that so few have a shot at, at, um, at having success at. And that's the thing, it's just like, the editorial rates have gone down year and year and year. And I know that I told you this, I, I took out the slide, but a friend of mine who was an A-list editorial illustrator, years ago he said to me, he's like, your business model, he said, is very different from mine. He said, my business model is I'm an editorial illustrator. I am the cheetah. 
on the plains. I hunt antelope, and that's all. And he's like, and the antelope have disappeared. He's like, you're like a hyena. You'll eat a turtle. You'll hunt a cat. You can take big game. He's like, he's like, you'll fucking climb a tree to get a bird. And he's like, and he goes, I've got to change. And it was interesting because he's one of the guys who survived this shift, um, moving into children's books almost exclusively. But I remember when the recession hit, we had this discussion. And, you know, I had had this discussion with my friends early on, but to see, like, some of my favorite editorial illustrators um, just sort of disappear and go through this hardship, it's, it's been really yeah. interesting to see and talk. Okay, the question, but, oh, go ahead. I just want to say that when I became the chair of the illustration department, yeah. and uh, one of the things that I decided to do, because I knew that illustration was on the wane, put in computers, yeah. you know, really, and I had a fight for getting, you know, like, the president of school, we were at a cocktail party, and I was like, I wanted computers, but nobody wanted to put them in. It was expensive, and it was this and that. So I waited until uh, at this cocktail party that the president was having, till the, I was the last one. And he says, well, Barbara, how's things going? I said, well, Jonathan, Jonathan Fanton was his name, not too well. Really? Why? I said, well, I don't think you're going to have an art school unless you get computers. <laughs> really? <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> I mean, it was like silence. Gets on the phone, goes, come with me. Gets on the phone. He called the provost, I forget her name right now. Hello? Provost? <laughs> I'm here with Barbara Nessam, and she said that we're not going to have an art school unless we get computers. I want to talk to you about this. <laughs> and that's how we got computers in the school. But I had to think about, OK, he's, he, my um, boss, my dean, said, well, I, I can't do it. You have to talk to him. Well, him was, I had to think, OK, what do I do? So then I had to meet with the provost. We went to breakfast. She, lunch was already too long. So she thought, well, breakfast, it's nice and short. So I thought, OK, I'm going to bring the New York Times job section. And I circled everything that has to do with computers in the job section, when you used to go to the New York Times to look for a job. <laughs> and everything that had to do not with computers in, uh, I don't know, red or green. But I think that everything that had to do with computers I did in green, and everything that didn't have to computers was red. And so there were like three little red things and a sea of green. And I said, tell me, if you were sending your child to school and you were paying $20,000, then it was then, you know how much it was, now it's like $100,000, and they couldn't come out and get a job, what would, where would you send them? And then I pulled out the New York Times for the job description about the job, how to get a job. And I said, would you send them to a school that did computers, or would you send them to a school that didn't do computers? <laughs> we got computers. <laughs> <laughs> so Very graphic solution. Yeah, Very well, graphic I mean, solution. I, I had it, you know, for people who think they, they are quick studies, they know it, you know, president of the school, provost of the school, smart people. If I don't think computers are anything, why would I want to listen to you? And so that was what I had to go over. Right. Because people didn't realize, I got into computers very, very early. People didn't realize that this was a shift, a major shift, now we know, a major shift in our lives. And I understood that. And how was I going to convince people who, and, and oh, I didn't want to get the job as the chair. Because if they didn't have computers, I didn't want to go in there. Because I was going to fail. Well, and I knew I was going to fail. We're so. talking about uh, the illustration field in some, something of a negative way, at least a, a, a gloomy way. Well, but I, I, yeah. I've edited uh, some of the Toshin books on illustration, and we've had over 600 illustrators in there, and the last volume was 100 of those illustrators. They're there. They're out there. They're doing stuff. Why? Well, I, I can address that. I think that... Um, the thing about owning your own business and running your own business, the thing is that the ability to create the work, I think, requires a deep sensitivity. Now, to run a business requires the opposite of that. 
So I think that that's one of the reasons why you see such low success in freelance. Now, the one thing about, at Parsons, I know they're very open about it, is that we're not teaching you to be illustrators. We're teaching you innovation and critical thinking. And we do have a lot of students who use this in the fields, creative mm -hmm. fields. Um, like I said, I think traditionally the success rate of freelance illustration has always been one or two students from each year. And that's the thing is that to do what we do and to remain doing it, you have to be good at a lot of different things. And I think that these publications really just show the best of the best. And if you are going to do this, I mean, it's, it's just a calling. But it's the best work. of the best is numerically fairly sizable. Yeah. And, you know, there, Peter, you're making character studies. A lot of kids are going into animation now, and there seems to be a market for these people. Or are you seeing something else? Um, you know, as I, as I described with that, that, that pyramid, you know, to, to tell, to have people going into, uh, into school to become character designers for feature films, it's a pretty, it's pretty small space. I mean, you only have two or three, who, or two or three designers at most on a, on a film. So I sometimes have that ethical conundrum as well, you know, to encourage people to become character designers. But, but these days what they, what they seem to be doing is to, to um, if you, they're training, the schools are training um, students, if they want to go into animation, to do a lot of different things, to be able to work throughout, through the whole pipeline. So not just only in the, you know, drawing on paper part of it, not the design part, but to be able to, uh, to paint digitally, to even to model, and to, so they, so the studio can use you as you move um, through the process. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of kids are gunning for, uh, for animation. A lot of, a lot of young people are going into video games, you know, what that's worth. But on the bright side, uh, you know, uh, it, to, to cast this in a, in a less gloomy light, I think, um, I think that this right now, there's, we're at an age now where, um, where for an artist to publish something um, unique, he no longer has to please an editor who has to please a vast audience. He can target uh, a niche audience and, uh, and they're out there. I mean, now that, you know, with the internet we have access to absolutely everyone, you can do this crazy, personal, beautiful, quirky work and find an audience for it. And if you only get, you know, a tiny percentage of what's out there, you can do it uh, very lucratively. And, you know, too, I remember when, you know, when I was coming up to, to, to do your own Prints to to print anything costs so much money. Now you can self-publish beautiful, beautiful little volumes. So entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, absolutely. I think mm -hmm. I think, uh, as I said before, being nimble and finding different ways to get yourself out there and different opportunities is absolutely the way to go. Especially because uh, it's still evolving so much. Um, it's, it's still changing, and you really have to have your ear to the ground. We don't have a lot of time, but, so I'd like to open it up. Um, I've got a sort of a two-part question, or maybe it's the same question with a, two sides to it. Um, about art direction, um, first, this is for all of you, um, was there ever a time or an experience when an art director really kind of did their job, where they suggested a change which improved something you were working on. And the other side of that is, I was hearing from all three of you that um, you had um, opportunities to do whatever you wanted. Um, and isn't that a sort of an abnegation on the art director's part? Are we seeing the art directors kind of um, Afraid of their shadows now? Is it is it dying out uh, art direction, and um, and does that mean that the work you're doing is becoming more like fine art? 
Um, st to address the first part of the question, I, with my only, only one toe in the editorial world, and that would be with The New Yorker, I have a, uh, a running, uh, gentle battle going with Francoise. Each, each time I do a drawing, uh, there's, there's this, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll do a sketch that I feel pretty confident about, and Francoise will perhaps not agree with it completely, or she'll have an idea um, to, to improve it. Um, it's, I either, I either have to, I always weigh it, I always weigh it, um, but I either have to, uh, it either works or I'll walk away from it. If, if, especially because The New Yorker is what it is and because, as I said before, it's, it's a place where an artist can actually put the drawing that he wanted to make on the cover. Once it becomes something I don't recognize or something I can't stand behind and, and really say, that, oh, I did that, um, then to me it's pointless. And I've, uh, I've, I've walked away, I've buried a, a, a bunch of images that might have gone if... Uh, uh, but but that's not to say that every now and then, every now and then, Francoise makes a suggestion that actually is like, oh shit, I guess she's right. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no illustrators want to admit this. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's you know you, you have to you 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 have to keep your mind open. Are you filming this? <laughs> this is going live straight to Francoise television. <laughs> Just kidding. She just turned it off. <laughs> Anybody else want to answer that quickly? I could say that the one thing that I crave more than anything else is really good art direction. And that can mean a lot of different things. I mean, uh, how was I? What's that? <laughs> how was I? Ah, you were, well, you were fantastic because... Thank you. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> because we're on camera. No, no. I, the thing that I loved about you, which was really kind of astounding to me, you... you showed me what it meant to be an art director who just trusted the person. And that's the thing, is like, I look at that stuff and I show some of it now and I was like, I had no business being an illustrator. But Steve was like, he saw something in it. He's like, okay, then I'll publish this. And I was like, wow, that's really cool looking back on it. But for me, I mean, I've had art directors, I've turned in sketches and they're like, this is what you mean, right? I'm like, I guess, I didn't see that at all. <laughs> but, and that's the thing, like getting back to the bands thing, like I love the really good collaboration when you make a greater whole out of something. And for me, an art director that can contribute an idea that's to greater than anything that you ever had, why not, you know, put it on the table. But I've had so many lately who are just like, you just do it and give me just like, like, like a, a a director who whispers a couple words into an actor's ear, and that's it, and that's all you need, and just go do your thing. Another question? Yes. Um, so I actually come from a science and kind of corporate background. I don't have a finance background, but now I'm an illustrator. And what I've noticed, because I'm like an outsider, I'm like forcing myself to learn about the history of illustration and graphic design and fine arts. And I'm actually noticing that, um, I mean, I, I love that you emphasize the computer. But I actually, what I feel, this is a personal thing, a lot of times the illustrations that resonate the most with me are the people who really appreciate hand-drawn. Even if they go to the computer later on, and I see this conflict between young illustrators where it's sometimes they don't feel the need to learn art history or the need to learn illustration. They just want to go straight to Illustrator or Photoshop. And I feel like they're losing something because you go online and every vector illustration looks the same. There's no personality and it's like, how do we get back to the stage where you teach nimbleness and entrepreneurship, but you also teach people that you want to create works that resonate, and there's a deeper understanding to that than just going straight to Photoshop. So how do you guys balance that when you're teaching the next I'm generation? I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, teaching is one of these things where every teacher I know, you have a love-hate thing with it. And, you know, a lot of times we'll tell students, you may not understand what I'm telling you now, um, seven years from now, it re may resonate. Like in my class last week, I was telling a student, I was like, "You have two choices. What I'm, t what I'm telling you, you can either uh, challenge me and call bullshit on what I'm doing, or continue to do your bad thing for quite some time, and then maybe it works out for you. Prove me wrong, but or you can take the time to 
sort of listen to your teachers. I think these schools are just full of just so many opportunities to explore both digital and traditional. Um, and that's the thing is like what we're really trying to do in these schools is just to raise the bar. Now, the marketplace is entirely different. Sometimes the marketplace allows this kind of sort of crap through, and it happens. But um, it's a really, there's no solution, I really don't think, to, to the crap that you see out there. But at the same time, it's just, we're, we're in the trenches trying. And, and, and I always felt when, even though I introduced computers into the school, I never stopped doing this. Yeah. So I'm an advocate of doing both. And Absolutely. you you need to learn a lot of things, and and do a lot of things because the world is big out there. And and as Peter said, you find your niche now with the internet. You know you you can find your audience there. I mean the audience is there, the internet, big, <laughs> all over the world. And uh, we're just in the beginning. You, you're you will. You, you, everyone will find your way as an artist. It's not like you're gonna, you know, okay, there's no editorial illustration, a little editorial illustration, but that's, it, things change and you have to change with it. And that's what I always tried to do. And I, I don't even think about it. Like when somebody said, do you wanna learn about computers? Yeah, okay, I'll think about it. So I, I didn't say no right away. I think that keeping your, options open without closing the door and saying, oh, I'm so used to doing the line this way. I don't want to do it this way. I just want to keep doing it this way. You know, I, I, uh, I've done a lot of work at, uh, at a studio called Blue Sky. Uh, they're, in, they're in Connecticut, actually, the only yeah. place that actually does features on the East Coast. And, uh, and I started to put in a few days a week there on when we were in production on, a, on an Ice Age film. And, um, for years before that, I was absolutely solo. I was just me in my studio, and I thought I would dread uh, going into into a studio and working with other people around. Um, but it was it was one of the most enriching things for me to be around other artists. And what what really surprised me was that these I'm thinking about a, a particular group of uh, of guys I knew there, who were absolutely unbelievable digital painters. I mean, they it just, just could do anything. And their knowledge of color and painting is absolutely fantastic. But on the weekend, they were out painting in plein air. You know, they were, they were working on paper. They were, they were, and they were studying the history of illustration and art and painting. And it was informing what they were doing digitally. And it was a, a perfect balance. It was, it was one of the most so it's the richest artistic experiences I ever had. Would you agree that right out of school you do the things that you've been taught or you see around that seem to be successful and then you find your voice after that? Or do you find your voice while you're young and just uh, in school? Uh, I, speaking for myself, I, I think, I mean, it's almost embarrassing if you could draw such a straight line from the drawings I did when I was six to what I'm doing now. I mean, even the sense of humor is pretty much the same. So, um, so for me, I, I've always, I think I always had the voice and it was just coming out in, in different ways. But, um, but I know that's not, that's not true for everybody. Some people find their voice, maybe a different voice later on. Yes. Is, um, speaking of sheer ignorance, do, uh, is it still carrying around a portfolio to get jobs? I mean, no. No, I <laughs> have no. What is this portfolio? Like how do people get jobs doing illustrating? You have a website. You have a website? You yeah. Point somebody to a website. You point somebody to yeah. a website. E okay. Even more so, uh, I've been speaking to a couple of uh, friends about this. Sort of t took an informal poll to see what was going on. And um, social media right now is, is absolutely crucial for, for just getting, getting the work out. Tweeting sketches, Instagram, here's what I'm working on, here's, here's a piece in sequence. And not only does it allow you sort of 
bragging rights. Hey, look what I'm doing. But it's it's promotion. You're you're getting uh, you're getting the work out there, and uh, and that's what's always evolving. These tools, the you know the social media. The tools are very narcissistic. They're totally necessarily so. Yeah, yeah. You have to strike a balance. I have tweeted six times. I think. <laughs> There was one question here, yeah, and then we'll have to stop. I, I think some of my questions have been answered, but I wanted to ask Peter something. Um, you know, back when I was a, an illustration major person, there were two other, there were two other illustrators whose work I really recognized because they were similar kind of style to mine. They were yours and Brian Ajar. Right, I, I killed him. And, <laughs> <laughs> it was just me. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Go ahead. And, and uh, ironically, I have been doing computer graphics for a living since the mid-80s, um, and presentations and everything. And one of the things you said about being an illustrator, you know, not understanding illustration, you know, the only people I trust to help me with my project are, like me, illustrators and background. So there is that sensibility. We're all bringing something to that. Even if you're doing graphic design for a PowerPoint presentation, you know, we're bringing something of that illustrator to the table, you know. And I don't, I don't trust people who just know how to do PowerPoint, know how to do Photoshop, know how to illustrate it, but don't know how to draw. Mm -hmm. You know, so it really does make a difference. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But I do, I don't know if you remember this, at the end of, the, of our senior year, all of us were concerned about getting work, because we knew, we didn't know what we were doing, and the teacher at Pasolago and all the people put together a seminar and said, and came up with a prediction that 70% of the class would not go on to do illustrations. I think that was a, a general, you know what I, mean? what? I think that was, I'm sorry, I think that was a generous yeah. uh, calculation. Mm -hmm. I, I, because I don't think 70, I don't think 30%. 30. 30 yeah. No, 70% would not. I, yeah, oh, no, yeah, yeah, not yeah, really. Right. I, I gave okay. a talk at, uh, at Parsons once uh, uh, for 80 illustrators and I just said, because I was bored with what I was talking about, uh, how many of you want to be illustrators? Nobody. <laughs> I said, so what, what's next? He says, well, maybe art therapy. My parents want me to make a living. Wow. So I was actually shocked because I, I thought that was kind of crazy. But when you're talking about thinking skills and strategies yeah. and things like that, it, make, it does make sense. You can go into illustration, you can yeah. go into graphic design and never be a graphic designer, but you could be a lot of other things. Can I say that that's the thing about, like I said, I, I constantly push... What we're trying to teach you is innovation and critical thinking. And the thing is that you have to understand there is absolutely, in the creative arts, there's absolutely no precedent for how you would do it. Sure, there are people who drew like you or, or had a similar sort of aesthetic or style, but really when it comes down to it, there is no precedent for you yourself going out into the world and presenting your voice. And it takes an incredible amount of courage. I've seen some of the most talented students I've ever come across and the thing is that like talent is just a fact talent is cheap and it's gotten cheaper it doesn't mean there aren't ways that you can because for me early on I, I met some folks and they were like keep your overhead as low as possible that's why in the bad years you're doing fine and when it's good you're the king of the world and like I, I, I still to this day like keep that in mind I would we're gonna have to end this now um, I just want to end it on one quote that I got from uh, uh, Peter's uh, film clip, which he didn't intend to show, uh, but was very delightful anyway, and I want to go back and watch all those movies that I have I on still watch that one. <laughs> but uh, the quote is, the end of the world is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Thank you all.